um, my enthusiasm for all things tropical and uh, just the way in which things kind of converge and distort in a city. And so to some extent, this is a talk, although I won't be talking about the Beach Boys or Winslow Homer and John Singer Sargent, this is a talk about artists being inspired by the city and then leaving a city. But um, before we go into that, and I'm just going to try to see if I can uh, share my screen here. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just address a couple things. I mean, obviously, this was go going to be a talk about uh, <clears throat> two white artists leaving the city and uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. And I conceived of this talk as a way to sort of parallel my own biography, um, leaving New York City and what I liked and what I have taken from that. This was also a talk that was really about artists who produce works of art that should be encountered in spaces, either in a gallery, in an installation, in a domestic space, uh, works of art that you can move towards and away from. Can everyone see these two photos on the, um, on the screen? Cool, all right. Um, and then all of that seemed a little bit privileged uh, and <laughs> a little unrealistic uh, in light of uh, the recent protests and the notion of going to a museum seems like an incredible privilege for almost everyone right now uh, in the face of this pandemic. So I just had a few words to talk about. I just wanted to sort of bookmark this, this talk into a much larger urban history of New York City. Um, like I said, this was supposed to be a, a lecture about finding one way, one's way back to the city through art created away from it or how an urban sensibility forged specifically in New York City at mid-century impacted the art made outside of the city in both cases, in both Martin and Judd's case, uh, in the rural Southwest. And I will proceed with that lecture, but my thinking from then until now has changed. Um, as this will be a lecture about art and space, I wanna address the spaces that each artist worked in. Uh, begin with Agnes Martin, who you see <clears throat> on the lower right of, uh, the, this photograph on the right, there she is on a rooftop with uh, Ellsworth Kelly, uh, Jack Youngerman, his wife and child, and uh, I believe Robert Indiana. They're sitting on a rooftop of a loft at the Conti Slip around 1958, the photographs by Hans Namath. Uh, it was for an article about artists moving into industrial spaces. And I would argue that Martin and her contemporary scene there um, were some of the first artists in Lower Manhattan to occupy uh, formerly industrial spaces, especially along the waterfront. Um, so she's in many ways the precursor to Donald Judd, who you see ensconced in his studio full of admirers. I think that's Julian Schnabel there. Um, art critics, fellow artists, art students uh, at 101 Spring Street, Spring and Mercer uh, in Soho, um, the area south of Houston in Lower Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> the artists of Conti Slip, which is an old kind of like, this is where ships used to dock from the 18th century. Um, that whole area is completely gone. Uh, there's a few surviving buildings, but um, this was like a part of New York whose the industry had surpassed it by the 1850s. Um, the South Street Seaport area is bounded by Water Street, which curves along the southeastern edge of Manhattan. Water Street was so named because this was once the shoreline of Lower Manhattan, gradually filled in by the Dutch from the 1640s onwards, and now some four blocks from the East River and the New York Harbor. The island of Manhattan derives its name from, uh, from the Lenape word Manahatta, uh, which was Man island of many hills. Um, below Wall Street, many of these hills were leveled for landfill to expand the footprint of the island. So in other words, even this kind of like late, you know, mid 19th century loft that Agnes Martin found herself in in the mid 1950s uh, was on landfill that was, began to be filled in by the 1640s. Just a few block, blocks from Agnes Martin's loft was the intersection of Wall and Water Street, where from the 18th century onwards, actually the 17th century from the 1650s, uh, there was one a slave market right at the intersection of Wall and Water Street, right on the shoreline of Lower Manhattan. Uh, and on the other side of the wall that Peter Stuyvesant, the last Dutch director general of New Amsterdam, had erected with slave labor 
there was the first, uh, what was called then Little Africa, the first kind of town or village of black inhabitants of Manhattan, uh, both freed and enslaved. These little Africas dotted the map of Manhattan throughout the 18th and 19th century. The first one was at Wall and Water Street, not far from the slave market. The second one moved to the area around Five Points. Um, and that community largely moved to the west side of Manhattan, uh, to West Soho, just a few blocks from where Judd's Loft was. So I think it's very important just to kind of consider uh, in a place like New York, how, how key slavery was and how, how crucial the black population of New Amsterdam, uh, where it was relatively easy to buy one's freedom under the Dutch, although Peter Stuyvesant did want to change New Amsterdam's uh, emphasis from a fur trading colony to a slave trading col colony. Uh, the important role that slavery played in New York State, it was only abolished in the 1820s. And the fact that even during the Civil War, um, a lot of Manhattan merchants, New York City was really considered the southernmost northeastern state. A lot of Manhattan merchants had a hard time supporting the Union in the fight against slavery during the Civil War because a lot of Manhattan merchants were getting wealthy at this World Trade Center through their direct ties with the slave trading South. Um, and in a lot of ways, the story of the different movement of industries which created these industrial spaces where these artists you know, found solace and work is told through the shift in, in, from like rural to mercantile, to, tra to sea trade, to uh, factory labor, which defined New York City's early industrial history. So I just wanna spend a little time, I wanted to just frame this so it doesn't seem completely like this sort of white fantasy as I was but recently, um, white fantasies of escape are often built by black bodies and then defined by their exclusion from these spaces. And uh, I will return to this topic at the end of this talk, but I've, I just wanted to begin by acknowledging that. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see. Yeah, I'll start here, actually, because this is uh, Agnes Martin's Night Sky, which is the painting, it hangs at the San Francisco SF MoMA, and, or night skis, night C, excuse me. Um, and this will, I'll use this painting as kind of my anchor, one, to show how impossible it truly is to talk about a painting. Uh, this is the same painting. You see it's kind of washed out in yellow as a close up, uh, kind of blends at, to completely blue um, from far away when you have a little bit of contrast in colors. Just how impossible uh, it is to, talk about the experience of encountering these works of art on a screen outside of these gallery spaces. Um, this talk really came out of my own experience with this work and with uh, visiting this home studio of, of Donald Judd at Spring and Mercer at 101 Spring Street, going to Marfa a couple times, and just kind of spending time with these works in silence. Um, I see my friend Kylie is is on this on this talk, and she and I spent you know like two hours one afternoon at the Hudson River Museum looking very closely at his etchings. I hope to kind of weave some of those observations and that discussion into this talk. Um, those ideal conditions and privileges that allowed us all space into these uh, access into these spaces don't exist right now, um, and I'm curious if any of you have seen this work in its original context, in a museum, in a gallery, in a lived space? Um, and I guess a big question I want to pose and op leave open for discussion a bit later is, how do we feel about abstraction and non-representational objects in the spaces and institutions that allow them? In other words, as a researcher, writer, and lecturer, my entire livelihood revolves around the open access to these spaces. Um, and I'm curious as to what sort of place this can hold in our lives while we're all quarantines and these, these spaces are closed. My goal here is certainly not to wistfully eulogize museums whose doors I pass freely through, but also where not everyone feels welcome. Uh, the restrictive austerity of white walls, I'm not trying to evoke that, nor attempt to recreate the optical and bodily experience of sharing space with these objects, but instead to describe them as I've experienced them, the historical context as I know it, 
and the conditions that engendered these, these objects. Outside of the immediate context of these works, though, I'm interested in the way in which leaving the city, once again, has engendered these artists to create. What's the link between urban and rural life that sparks the imagination? And finally, I'm gonna quote Agnes Martin here. Uh, Martin once famously said, I paint with my back to the world. So therefore, I hope to take this hour to kind of like look Janice-like both at the work that she's painting and the world at her back. See how this stuff fits in. Um, both Martin and Judd kind of came to the city from the plains. Judd was born in Missouri. Martin was born in 1912 in Saskatchewan. Uh, as she, she, she's the older artist and the kind of one I'll be talking about first, I'll just go ahead and introduce her biography. Um, she's born in, in the plains of Canada. Uh, spends, you know, she was, you know, a, a very accomplished swimmer and spent a lot of her time swimming. swimming. Swimming, of course, is a solitary sport. She was almost poised to be an Olympic swimmer. Uh, and the first two decades of her life were really shuttling between the Pacific Northwest, New Mexico. She was trained as a teacher. There was something kind of always as like the camp counselor or a teacher to her. And it wasn't until the 1950s that she comes to New York to work at, to study fine art at the Teachers College of Columbia. Um, for the next 15 years or so, she oscillates between New York, New Mexico. Uh, around this time in her life, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So there are periods in her life which she later chose to kind of obscure. Um, to ch chose not to talk about. And there are also periods of her life where she just kind of falls off the map. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those periods as well. So I want to just shift a little bit and talk about this work because um, it's kind of a nice place, even though the color is completely washed out. But this was, this is a painting that she painted in 1962 titled Night Sea. She painted this while living in the Conti Slip area. Uh, I should mention that, you know, although we might, you know, I know a lot of you lived in New York or live in New York and are familiar with like lower Manhattan, the South Street Seaport area today is just a tiny little sliver of what it once was. Uh, this had been up until the 1850s, New York's main port. The first, uh, first ships that connected like Manhattan's ports to China from 1818, like left from the South Street Seaport. Uh, the first steamship which linked, Robert Fulton steamship with, which linked Manhattan and Brooklyn uh, left from South Street, the South Street Seaport area. This is, you know, the kind of like, this is where Manhattan got its nickname as the World Trade Center. And uh, by the 1850s, as I mentioned before, larger tonnage vessels started started docking on the Hudson River side, on the west side of Manhattan. And this area fell into kind of, it became a slum, basically. This is where sailors on shore leave would party. Water Street, if y'all have ever seen um, Gangs of New York, you know, there's that scene where that, there's like a bar where there's like a jar full of ears in formaldehyde. Not what you'd expect in our history le lecture, but true. Um, that was actually at a bar on Water Street called The Hole in the Wall. Next to that was Kit Burns's Rat Pit. That was where like you could pay a nickel or a quarter to see rat versus dog, man versus dog, man versus rat versus dog. Um, and this was also, you know, a lot of these dingy dives were the headquarters of blackbirders, people who would kidnap freed African Americans in New York and sell them back into slavery. If you're, familiar, if you're familiar with the film 12 Years a Slave, uh, that's the sort of thing that would happen along wa uh, Water Street. As the Brooklyn Bridge gets built in the 1880s, this area becomes even more remote. Um, the ASPCA was actually formed to shut down sportsmen's halls where you'd have these dog and rat fights. And by the early 1920s, um, almost, there's almost no activity down here. There's a fish market. That's about it. Uh, in the 1950s, Betty Parsons, who is a gallerist and artist, uh, encouraged her friends, and her friends were people like Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, who you know worked and lived not far away, uh, Ellsworth Kelly, Robert Indiana. In fact, uh, 
it was Kelly who told Robert Indiana while he was working at an art store that he should start looking for studio space in the South Street Seaport area. Um, <clears throat> and, and eventually Agnes Martin. The art scene at this time was sort of centered around Greenwich Village uh, and it was focused on the American abstract expressionists, people like Jackson Pollock, um, Barnett Newman, uh, Willem de Kooning. I'm seeing if I have an image here. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the mid 1950s, it was sort of dominated by the New York school. Um, <clears throat> Jet Pollock famously said, it seems to me that the modern painter cannot express this age, the airplane, the atom bomb, the radio in the old forms of the Renaissance or of any other past culture. Each age finds its own technique. Uh, and this was sort of this big, you know, kind of brash, performative, gestural, dripped paint was the real order of the day. Clement Re Greenberg, the main critic that supported Pollock said, where the old masters created an illusion of space into which one could imagine walking, the illusion created by a modernist is one into which, into which one can look, can travel through only with the eye. So in other words, this is an optical abstraction being practiced by these artists. Um, there, here's uh, Martin and Ellsworth Kelly uh, in, I believe, Kelly's studio on the South Street Seaport. So in, in contrast to these sort of brash, convivial, uh, alcoholic, loud, violent, largely male and heterosexual artists, the scene in the South Street Seaport area uh, was quiet, introspective. A lot of, a lot of the um, artists came from this sort of stern Protestant backgrounds. Um, a lot of the artists were gay or queer. Um, Rauschenberg and Johns were partners, so too briefly were Kelly and Robert Indiana. Um, Agnes Martin, you know, was a pretty solitary figure, but w w had, you know, had romantic attachments to Betty Parsons, amongst other artists that were in that area. And this was in many ways like an, an old sailor's neighborhood that had been written about by Walt Whitman. And historically, this had been a kind of like, you know, the, the piers and the docks of lower Manhattan were gay cruising areas and also being remote from the rest of the city were kind of places where you could be yourself. Uh, Martin spoke of the kind of freedom, the humor, but more, most importantly, what bonded these artists, none of whom were terribly social, was this devotion to one's work. And, she's, and she, uh, in, in her reminiscences, talked of, you know, <clears throat> living in this almost ascetic, austere life, monk-like, monastic rigor of working 10 to 12 hours a day and then, you know, riding your bike across the Brooklyn Bridge at night, going to Prospect Park if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to see nature, but returning to these former industrial spaces in order to do work. Um, and that was one of the first things that really struck me about, about uh, Night Sea. There, there's Martin in 1957 uh, in her studio. The walls didn't even reach the, the ceiling in this, in this hundred foot long old sailmaker's loft. Uh, absolutely frigid, cold water loft. Uh, luckily, a lot of the artists could, could get like a hot water shower at the uh, local Siemens Institute um, not far from there. <laughs> And I just can't help but look at this. Uh, I mean, she's wearing a basically an insulated onesie, which is absolutely de rigueur uh, fashion for a cold water loft in which there's no heat. Um, returning to this painting, the first thing that struck, struck me about this was, and I think you can get a sense of this in this screen, the layers of color. You see this kind of like green painted over a lapis lazuli. Martin very seldom used these these like intense and historical blues. This Night Sea is one of the few paintings where she combined lapis lazuli, which is you know one of the most expensive, historically one of the most expensive and rare pigments. Almost traditionally, it was reserved for the veil of the Virgin Mary. You know, if if a patron in like Quattrocento, uh, Italy, really wanted to like spend money on an altarpiece they allow you know they paid for lapis lazuli to be the color that, that the virgin mary's veil was used uh there's also the hints which of course you can't see on a screen but in person it becomes more apparent of gold leaf 
gold leaf and gesso are also materials that Martin used briefly in the early 1960s. Um, <clears throat> and the, while these, these materials might have had an art historical resonance for Martin, uh, they also add to the sort of optical dazzle of, of this work, which again, you know, this is probably shot from a foot away. This is shot from two feet. You can really see the difference here between the sort of washed out yellow green effect of like the light versus as you get closer. So she's using traditional materials. Around the early 1960s, Martin also adopts the grid as the kind of primordial framework that she will arrange her paintings around. Prior to that, she had done kind of biomorphic, biomorphic abstraction, a little bit of figurative work, but little by little, she moves to the grid. And these, these paintings were basically like made by, you know, using a ruler and a T-square and just lining it out. She would make a postcard size sketch in her notebooks and then painting and then let, painting this inch by inch, foot by foot down the painting. Most of the paintings of her mature period of which uh, Night Sea is a consummate example, uh, measure about six feet by six feet, which to me is, you know, kind of, I mean, that's about someone's arm span. So it's about as big as, uh, <clears throat> as a single artist could, could, could like reach. But if you think about that in terms of like bodily scale, it's also it gives you a sense of like how you can like step into these works. They're, they're human size square. And I think that's really important for these. Um, so both Martin and Judd were associated with this term minimalism, which is kind of what like art critics came up with in the mid 1960s when they were describing this reaction, both against the, uh, again, sort of sloppy, gestural, expressive, wild brushwork of the ab -X abstract expressionists of the 1950s, um, and also a response to the kind of brass, or brassy, excuse me, um, flashy, uh, tight pop that immediately preceded that. And I would also argue that um, Robert Indiana, who most people know through his famous insignia, uh, Love, which began as a postcard from MoMA's show in 1964, a Christmas postcard, uh, was in many ways the leading pop artist of that, of that school at that time before Andy Warhol. Um, so both Judd and, and Martin made art that was, you know, kind of a rebuke of both the sort of like gestural abstract expressionism and the kind of representative commercialized nature, commercial embracing nature of pop art. Um, <clears throat> but both also considered uh, their relationship uh, to abstract expressionism to be kind of like important. For, for Judd, it was, um, he, he appreciated Pollock because Pollock treated the paint like paint and the canvas like canvas. Like his art was the direct relationship, you know, like the direct result of an encounter with gravity, house paint, and canvas. Um, and for Martin, Martin saw a kind of existential, spiritual, emotional affinity between uh, her work, her you know, austere, rigorous, gridded work and uh, abstract expressionism. Minimalism was a term that neither artist embraced and uh, Judd kind of wonderfully rejected it. Um, oh, I was getting a little ahead of myself. So <clears throat> around 1967, Agnes Martin uh, was, had a couple breakdowns, uh, one in which she was seen wandering around Park Avenue uh, muttering incoherently, she was checked into Bellevue, and around this time, she uh, decides to leave New York for good, and uh, you know, empties her studio, puts it in a trailer in her truck, and uh, <clears throat> about a year later, ends up near Cuba, New Mexico. Pulls into a filling station as she's filling up her truck. Uh, she asks the, the owner of the filling station if there's any lands to rent nearby. The owner knows someone, uh, and she moves to a remote mesa about 20 miles down a dirt path uh, with no structures to speak of. She first builds a little adobe structure, which you see behind her, 
Later, she chainsaws down some trees and, and, create, and builds a log cabin. And little by little, by about 1971, she starts making work again. First printing, then, then she kind of uh, re, you know, reintroduces the grid back into her work uh, and, this, and sort of enters into the sort of like golden period of her work. Uh, most of her work at that point celebrating innocence, celebrating um, happiness, celebrating pure joy. Um, and she, around this time, she also kind of gains this reputation as this sort of amazing, like enigmatic desert mystic. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting. And now I want to sort of pivot to Donald Judd. I'll get back to Martin probably. But um, I think it's really interesting that you have on the one hand, this kind of group of, uh, you know, queer artists living in lower Manhattan. And then within a decade, that sort of idea of moving into industrial space and moving into these sort of disused spaces of like industry, um, the garment district was west, of, was west of Broadway in the 1850s and 1870s. The very same architects who were building these cast iron lofts along Water Street start building more and more factories, more and more department stores, more and more warehouses in cast iron. I want to talk a little bit about cast iron as a, as a building material um, in the 1850s and 1870s. And then all of a sudden you have these kind of like I mean, there's almost no more patriarchal artist than Donald Judd in many ways. You know, he was a, a father of two. He, you know, he and his wife move into this space and, they, and he tries to kind of rebuild and recapitulate um, both the household and the factory uh, into one space. So Donald Judd <clears throat> uh, had a military background. He, as I mentioned before, he's born in Missouri. Uh, after, after he serves in the army, he studies at Columbia, uh, first as an art historian, which kind of speaks to his level of depravity and desperation, uh, and later as, uh, you know, an art critic. And he's, you know, sort of at a very, you know, reading Donald Judd's writing is like pouring cold water over your eyes. He, he spoke forcefully with great clarity and uh, starts out as a painter and then very quickly pivots into what he would call specific objects. In 1963, he writes a kind of, if not a manifesto, a report on the type of art that he and his friends were doing, the type of art being done in the early 1960s by his group, and he calls it specific objects. Now, what are specific objects? Specific objects are, for Judd, they should be visual objects. Uh, sorry, that's such a tiny little screen. I think we're used to in the age of quarantine, there we go, uh, looking at tiny screens, but I owe you more. Um, they should be visual. If they're, they're not sculpture or painting, if they, if they are on the floor, they don't, stand, they don't rest on like a plinth, like traditional sculpture. For, for Judd, it was very important to do away with history. It was very important to do away with this notion of narrative. He, like Greenberg, like Pollock, objected to this idea of illusionism. Like what you see is what you get with Judd. Um, this is an entitled work uh, that was installed on the third floor of a building that Judd was able to purchase in 1968 with help with a, with a fellowship from the Guggenheim. Uh, this building had been an 1870s factory, originally painted a kind of buff off-white uh, with sand mixed into the paint. And this is where I want to get into uh, the history of cast iron buildings. Um, I think I'm going the wrong way. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so he, he buys this cast iron building in 1968 and slowly converts it into a um, <clears throat> living and workspace. It's five stories with a basement. Um, and I think this is a kind of good, good time to sort of talk about the industrial history of Manhattan. So the cast iron building, and this is his building at Spring and Mercer, uh, was invented by a man named James Bogardus. Bogardus sort of noticed that cast iron storefronts were starting to line buildings in Boston and Baltimore. Cast iron was a pretty easy material to produce. Um, and you could very quickly kind of put up 
a, a storefront with larger windows, large pane, gla pane glass windows started to be produced by the mid 1850s. And you could sort of like, you know, put up a building. It's almost, it's modular architecture. It's like the Ikea of Victorian architecture. Um, you'll notice that on, in Judd's building, every single floor has identical window units. And yet the dimensions and the details of each floor as you go up uh, change ever so slightly. You'll notice that on the, for example, the, uh, the, the attic of the fourth floor, there's a little pediment. There are three pediments abo above the second floor windows on the Spring Street facing side. That these little historical details could be easily produced, easily molded, and just like screwed and bolted to the front of a building. The other thing that cast iron buildings offered, uh, which were advantageous for the type of functions that they served, and these were mostly factories, warehouses, department stores, etc. Um, the dome at, at the United States Capitol, for example, is, is a cast iron dome. It was produced during the Civil War in the 1860s. Um, the other thing that cast iron buildings offered that like, were, made them advantageous over brick and mortar buildings, and you see a partially brick and mortar building next, next to Judd's building there, uh, was that you could have an open floor plan that you could use cast iron both decoratively on the outside, allowing for bigger windows. Big windows are good in the era of gas lights before buildings are being are using electricity. You wanted to maximize the amount of sunlight that you got in a building like this. Um, and also you wanted, you could have thin walls and an open floor plan, which made a lot of sense for factories, for storage, for this new American consumerism, which was kind of sweeping through with its epicenter in New York City in the second half of the 19th century. One of the only things that cast iron buildings weren't good for, for from the perspective of uh, a Victorian New Yorker, was living. No one wanted to live in these things at all. This would have been the absolute worst thing you could possibly do. Uh, Vic, you know, Victorians liked small windows. They liked cozy spaces. They liked thick walls. Small spaces that were easy to heat and easy to cool. Think about how sweltering and disgusting New York City is then and now during the summer. Um, by the way, Agnes Martin leaves in 1967 in the middle of a sweltering summer. Who, wouldn't, who can't relate with that? Um, but yeah, I mean, the notion of living in a space like that, this was absolutely anathema to New Yorkers. Um, so, you know, Soho to this day is known as like the cast iron distri district of lower Manhattan. You have like over 500 of these buildings still surviving. Um, by, the eight, by the 1950s, these buildings were considered a fire hazard. The floors were soaked with oil. They were filled with dust. They were filled with particles from all these old you know, garments and things like that. These were old factories and warehouses. Uh, the, the New York City Fire Department called this area Hell's Hundred Acres. Um, you know, if a, one of these buildings was on fire, you just basically let it fall to the ground because it would turn into a cast iron stove. So in other words, it's hard to believe today but this property was cheap and undesirable by the time Donald Judd is able to kind of purchase this house or purchase this building. And he understood that the vertical orientation, the vertical kind of like format of the factory where, you know, if this is a shirt making factory, the collar would be made, you know, on the, on the fifth floor, the, the, you know, the body of the shirt would be made on the fourth floor. The arms would be sewn on, on the third floor. The, you know, the whole, the buttons would be sewn on the, the entire shirt as it's assembled on the second floor and it'd be sold out of the store fr front on the bottom floor. He understood that he could sort of organize his life and the making of his art and the raising of his family along these same lines. So from the top floor to the bottom floor, he sort of instituted this or incorporated this 19th century idea of industry with this 20th century idea of like living and working in the same space. The top floor was where he and his children slept. Um, that's where they slept. <laughs> so that's, that's where he and his, his wife uh, shared a bed on a, on a kind of, you know, so he didn't want his sculpture to be on a plinth, but he allowed for his bed to be on a plinth. And if you've ever visited this space, uh, the little, white kind of stack of, I guess, structures or space in the background. Uh, that, that's, those are bunk beds for his two children, Flavin and Rainer. Yes, he named, he named his, uh, his children after his friends. Uh, there's a Dan Flavin after the aforementioned son. Uh, 
like like hanging on one side facing the Mercer Street side of the w windows. There's one of Judd's early kind of objects still very much in the painting phase over their bed. There's a John Chamberlain in the corner and each floor you'll notice that he kind of organizes his objects in the art that he collected, displayed and of friends of his that he supported in these spaces. So he would design, oh let's see that's um, he, this is his, uh, this is the second floor. This is the kitchen. This is where he'd have dinner parties. This is his dining room. Um, he designed all of the furniture in this space. Uh, he got the proportions for the table, uh, for, by just by multiplying the proportions of the window of, of his building by two. Uh, the, the chairs fit in perfectly. You'll notice that these two, I don't know if the, my arrow is coming through, but those chairs are perfectly flush with, with the top of the table upright, rigid, um, and the, but I, the thing I want to stress to you, and then up above here, there's a little loft above the little kitchen. There's a cute little bathroom. Um, I mean, I visited, I visited 101 Spring twice when I was living in New York, and both times I went back and completely rearranged my apartment. Like if, if you want to like, you know, like loft living in the 70s will really make you uh, Marie Kondo the shit out of your place. Um, but also there's something kind of playful here, you know, it's like, and that's something I want to stress with Donald Judd is that like, the, yes, he did come up with these kind of rigorous rules, you know, there should be no reminders of history, there should be no narrative, you should be true to your materials, but at the same time, he sort of allowed for the kind of humanity, the incongruities, the inconsistency, the happenstance of like everyday life, call it chaos, if you will, to determine, uh, to determine the form of his work. And I wanna to move to this piece, which is titled in his catalog, Re Resine DSS 33. Um, it's from 1962. And this is when he was still living in a, living and working in a studio on, on East 19th Street, not far from Max's Kansas City. And this piece consists of two pieces of wood that are conjoined together at a right angle with, if, as you can see on this, on this image on the right, a black iron pipe that he found that had already been kind of like conjoined in a right angle. Uh, the pipe's arms are uneven, as you can see on the image, excuse me, on the left, but the pipe ends on each side of the wood directly in the middle. You know, so in other words, the distance between here and here and here and here is the same. The distance from this pipe to the outer edge of this shorter piece and the and this pipe to the outer edge to the shorter piece to the corner is exactly the same. And here, because this arm is longer, this panel is wider. Does that make sense? I need people to, to nod here. Otherwise, I'm going to be like, I'm totally rant. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so in other words, there's this, and, there's, and then there's this other kind of thing that happens with his work where it's like, okay, he wants, he he wants his work to be true to the material. So he's making no bones about the fact that this is a found industrial piece of iron, right? Not unlike the sort of loft that he and his family will soon move into. Um, and yet he like, what he has control over are these two pieces of wood, which he has conjoined and decides to paint a beautiful cadmium red. He loved cadmium red. And for him, it's sort of like, you know, staining plywood was not being untrue to the material. Staining plywood was revealing the grain, revealing the materiality, while at the same time, let's face it, being kind of pretty. It's red and black. Seen from one angle, and this again, uh, I curse not being able to be in a space with this, but seen from one angle, you read that black is flat and opaque. And as you get closer to it, you start to perceive the depth of this pipe, something so insignificant. I mean, this is basically a found object. And red against black has certain connotations. It's sort of like, you know, it creates a, in, if you close your eyes, you would see a sort of green around in that, in the place of, of, of red. And the black would read as white, you know, sort of like optical illusion of like closing your eyes and staring at that thing. So he wanted his art to be optical, and yet just to deal with things as they were, if that makes sense. In other words, he's allowing the sort of irregularity of this found piece of metal to determine the form and the dimensions of the work that he has control over. Um, and this, I, you know, really, and again, 
thank you, Kylie, for, for helping me with this. Um, this became very, very clear to me when we uh, exhibited a suite of his prints, uh, these etchings he did in 19, between 1977 and 1978 uh, at a museum where I used to work in Yonkers. Uh, as you can see here, we have 16 of these things. I like to think of them as variations on a theme. So what you're seeing are effectively 16 different combinations of how to express maybe shape or pattern within, within the same kind of like exterior framework. In other words, and by exterior framework, I mean this kind of like trapezoidal shape that you see here. So, note it, so let's look closely at this thing, because I think this is a fun one to look at. Um, so remember that Judd's thing is truth to materials and that art should not be illusionistic. Okay, those are, the, those are some of the parameters that he is like making his art by. So if you're making a print of what might be perceived as a three-dimensional object, how might you reject illusionism in in that thing remember he doesn't like illusionism illusionism means trying to fool the audience they're looking into a three-dimensional space illusionism is tied to the history of european painting which judd absolutely wants to reject so looking at this piece you'll notice if you look at the uh or diagonal line here and the diagonal line here and the diagonal line of the bottom edge of this shape uh, that these two are in fact not parallel, and that this is also not parallel with that. This is a slightly more open angle than this would be if this line had continued. Can you see that? So in other words, by just tweaking that, and our, and our expectation is that when we look into a one-point perspectival, like illusionistic space, imagine like a, a sort of um, an altarpiece from the Italian Renaissance, imagine like, you know, Raphael's, School of Athens, um, any number of like European paintings which attempt to recreate three-dimensional space by offering the eye away into them, uh, notice the way in which just this subtle little tweak of these angles completely changes that. Um, it's too bad I can't hear you all say, wow, no. Uh, but. Uh, <clears throat> But so, in other words, he's allowing this to be flat. And once we're confronted with the fact that we can't, like, successfully perceive this as a three-dimensional illusion, we then are just confronted with, you know, just looking at this as shapes. You can kind of toggle between this being read as a box with this kind of angled plane in it and this being just a number of shapes. And you'll notice that, like, he can just continue playing with this. These angles get more like obtuse, more acute. If he sort of stacks them up, if he has a box floating within a box, which wouldn't necessarily make sense in, in real space, but sort of if you're working with the two-dimensional medium of prints, you can do this. Um, and then, and this is what I love, uh, then he, end, and this is something I actually didn't know when I was, when I was researching this to put this on, on the walls at the museum, so notice the way in which each of these 16 pieces is completely different. There's not one repetition. He plays just by tweaking these little lines in each one into something completely different. Um, what I, you know, what I assumed is that these were kind of like diagrams for works that he would later do. They certainly did remind me of the 100 aluminum boxes, which he would later have installed uh, at the Chinati found Foundation at, or at his like, our former army barracks that he have eventually ended up purchasing, moving to Marfa and assembling his work around. Um, so in other words, you can sort of see this like clear progression between the way in which this thing uh, inhabits the space of his, of his loft in New York to the way in which these uh, repeated hundred aluminum boxes here, uh, each one, totally different and I will refer to those prints as almost like a diagram of a schematic map of like what you can do within these parameters. Again, that sense of playfulness. Um, but also the opticality. You know, he said, you know, art doesn't have to be anything but interesting to look at. And 
So it becomes less about the sort of like mathematical or geometric kind of nerdy combinations that you can, you can manifest in these works and be becomes throughout the day this kind of shimmering hall of mirrors, which, you know, like changes at every second. So it's about the sort of ephemeral effect of light, especially like southwestern desert light as it, as it shoots across the gallery floor. Notice the way in which these, these boxes, if you want to call them that, are aligned with the, with the plates of, you know, cast concrete on the, on the floor. Um, this was had been an old like shed that he basically just sort of opened up and, and added windows to um, <clears throat> added adding a roof on the top because you know it leaked uh, <clears throat> but yeah, just this like kind of playfulness that we don 't normally associate with Judd that I find very refreshing. I wanted to um play a video of Flavin Judd, the aforementioned uh, discussing discussing this very work. I'm hoping that the audio works. Um, I'm gonna, before I go full screen, I'm gonna just ask to those of you that I can see to give a thumbs up when the audio starts going. Um, so, all right, I'm pressing play. Can you all hear it? Said we hear it, but we're actually still seeing the- Oh, the oh right, right, right. Oh, right. okay, hold on. You might have to cancel or change what you're showing. There we go. How about yeah. that? Yep. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. Cool. So, who's in a Marfa? Raise your hand. Wow. Tips, tips are necessary. All right. Um, in the MoMA show, if you haven't seen it, you will see. Ted, can you turn it up on your screen? Sure. Work laid out in chronological format throughout four different spaces. And can you all hear it? floor pieces um, where he kind of gets going in the artwork and then in the next room you have the pieces from the 70s which are where he starts using multiple units so four four um, boxes with a connector or six boxes on the floor not connected so that gets to about 75 and then there's a third room uh, which gets us to where this would be and in that room you have one largish not this large, one largish plywood piece um, and some other works. And one of those is a set of floor pans, stainless floor pans, which, all, which are all the variations. And then there's a copper stack and um, a work with um, four, four separate units lined up. After doing those, which are, in the, and those are all multiple works where each element is the same. They're simply a repeat, like uh, one box five, six times, or aluminum boxes, four units lined up in a row. And, and that's about the mid 70s. If you go to Texas, you will see other works of the mid 70s where he has repeated, repeated uh, galvanized boxes that go from wall to wall that are um, our place in the Judd Foundation and Marfa called the Block. And basically, if you walk through those first three uh, rooms of MoMA, you'll see Don progressing from the flat paintings where he was realizing he was not a painter. Um, and his work moved to the floor, and it got more and more three-dimensional, more and more involved with space. And in the works of the 70s, where he's getting, getting to a larger scale, a scale that you have to walk around in, a scale that is bigger than human scale, um, which is not the case for his work necessarily in the 60s. You will see that they're still rather simple. As I mentioned, they are single uh, units that are identical. In some of his works in the 80s, he would get into situations like this. If you're counting by spaces, you have one, one space and then two space. Um, and if you count like from here, it's one space, one space, two space, one space, one space, two space, one space, one space, two space. And those are offset, right? So this one's ends, that one ends, that one begins, those two begin. And this is basically Don playing with space and playing with, um, after he's done his work where it is four boxes lined up in a row, identical boxes lined up in a row, 
after he's done his work where which are the stacks which are identical units going up to the ceiling after he's done all that he's starting to play with okay what else can you do and if you all know what a progression is it's the it's the type of work where you have um, a long tube with boxes hung underneath and the relationship of the boxes to the spaces between the boxes is an inverse so you have a box that is let's call it five units whatever they are long and then on the other side you'll have a space that is five box of four space of four box of three etc etc et so they switch after doing the kind of simple units strung repeating he's always trying to and increasingly it's playing with what you what can you do given a space and what can you do given his own restrictions and his own restrictions being that the artwork has to not refer to other things. So there's no um, grand uh, existential titles. Um, the, the material as in here is, is, is plywood. You understand immediately what the material is. It's not, it's not painted, it's not covered with something, it's not layered. Basically Don is interested in art that is completely graspable immediately. And it's not that you understand what he's doing, like some of the progressions, you can't figure out the mathematics just by looking at it, but you see that there's some kind of order there. You said the exact order might not be understood immediately, but you see that there is one that it's figured out. And that's Don's way of playing with space without referring to, I don't know, golden sections or perspective in the Renaissance. It's his way of doing work that only refers to what we are doing now, what we're doing here. And so in this, this one, it's not that complicated, right? It's the, it's the one, one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two. And in different slices, right? The top and the middle and the bottom are all on different locations vis-a-vis um, -vis each other. And so those are basically, he's layering the ingredients um, to make the piece more complex. And um, he's, he's interested in complexity. He's not interested in confusion. And um, so it, one of his rules is, is that while the piece um, has to be comprehensible um, immediately, it can still be complex. It can be, still be playful. And this is basically everything he's doing is playing with the space, playing with the material, playing with how, what can you, what can you do given his own strictures? And so in this case, and this is the only piece like this, this is this three layered uh, way of playing with the space, with the slants, with the repeating sequence, and with the different offset sequences. And this is what, he did this in 1980, so this is what he's doing with the space. And you'll see, um, um, if you go to Marfa and you see the 100 Lumen pieces, that is a way of playing with a space in which each 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 piece is a is a is a variation on the idea of a box. Okay, they are open at both ends, open at one end, um, tilted, slanted, top, straight, top, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are related to this piece in the case where you have um, um, a given. You have in this case you have the, the the size of the units and how many you can fit given space, which was based on Castelli's um, space in Green Street. This is as big, as big as it could be. And then within those parameters, you're playing with whatever you can do. It's also related to the later works made out of color in that just as he found something new to do with plywood, um, if you go, when you go to the MoMA show, you will see um, the painted aluminum pieces. And he started those three years after three, four years after this piece, when he got tired or not tired is the wrong word because he kept kept doing the, the works in plain plywood, but he wanted to explore color more. So he invented the pieces which were made out of painted aluminum. And in that way, he, within his own strictures, he allowed himself a format to play with colors, which he didn't, could not satisfy with these works or the works that you're probably familiar with which are one color plexiglass and one color metal, which was his limit for, for the earlier metal works. So. <clears throat> all right, so I'm, uh, that's fun and all, but I'm going to uh, 
chill out on that for a little bit. Did, did y'all hear it okay? Yeah, no? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, kind of, you know, what I found really compelling about that was one, the way in which each of these units, as Flavin calls them, um, <clears throat> allows, you know, al allows for this variation, which he can do. He can have two slats diagonally. He can choose where those diagonal slats, like whether they meet at the center of that back panel or like run parallel to the top plane of, of this, call it a box. Um, but that this, this sort of determines the parameters of his work and also is interesting on its own, I hope, uh, without being total, without being determined by like history or by context or by some kind of narrative, that you should just you know be you should over time you can sort of spend time with these objects and sort of figure out that there is some kind of order. Um, I'm going to go back to full screen here just momentarily. Uh, back to my images. Um, and so strangely, <clears throat> to return to the urban context here, and this is this wonderful uh, painting by Edward Hopper at the Whitney Museum. Um, so what is it about the city? And I love this because it's sort of a cadmium red that Hopper uses on the, on the top, second floor of that building with a cast iron storefront that you can see on the bottom. So in other words, for both Martin and Judd, uh, the city engendered this type of thinking about objects, about surfaces. You know, I, if you've ever walked across the Brooklyn Bridge, and I don't want to be super New York centric, but if you've ever walked over um, a slatted wooden bridge over water, depending on, you know, at a pedestrian speed, you can see the water rushing beneath your feet, and it almost feels like you're floating above the water. And looking at Martin's work, especially Night Sea, which is the one I, you know, sort of focused on, you get that sense that you are, there's this sort of Cartesian grid, the X, Y axes that keep sort of like fluctuating, seeming, you know, there's, although Martin, like Judd, would have rejected any kind of like literal illusionistic reading of this work. This isn't supposed to represent anything. Um, you almost get the sense that you're looking at like a gridded, like, like a grill on the, on the street and there's water, dark, radiant blue water rising up through that, through that steel grid. Or you think a, a bit about the grid of the city, be it in San Francisco, be it in, in New York City, the way in which that sort of rectilinear arrangement of space determines the way that we live. Um, and so, you know, being that Night Sea was one of the last paintings that she, you know, one of the first paintings to introduce the grid and uh, one of, you know, a sweet part of a suite of paintings that she created before leaving the city, giving up on art for a few years and then eventually returning to it through the grid. And that these artists lived like, you know, it's very easy if you're in Manhattan or, you know, anywhere in Brooklyn or Queens to forget that you are next to, next to water. But here these artists were living right around Water Street in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, with this ever constant reminder in the same way in which Judd's organization of space and conception of the found materials, you know, like of a, of a steel pipe determines like the way in which spaces of living and work uh, is laid out in these lofts. Um, and then that becomes translated into this overarching view of like the control of land and vast resources uh, in Marfa that, you know, he sort of takes over this old army barracks. It was called Fort D.A. Russell. I looked it up. Thank God D.A. Russell was not a Confederate soldier. He was in fact a Union soldier. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that this sort of idea of like what you do with, I don't know, 100, 100 square feet in a loft versus like a thousand square feet in, a, in an old grain or artillery shed in, in the Southwest desert of, of Texas. Um, 
and that this is tied to this idea of our existential place in the universe. This is tied to this notion of like sort of, you know, for, for Judd, the literalness of Pollock and for, for Martin, the kind of like abstractness of Pollock, the, the spiritual existential nature of Pollock, that these two things of the New York school in the 50s could inspire these two artists uh, to do the work that they do in the 60s and 70s. And of course, to return to what I, my initial concern at the beginning of this talk, um, before I open it up to questions, um, you know, these artists are, this is, this is art being made in the 60s. This is art being made in the era of protest of, you know, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, of, of Martin Luther King, of Malcolm X, of during the civil rights protests, during the sort of summer of love, during the, uh, the women's liberation movement. I mean, this is, you know, this is, here's the most violent sense of like time of upheaval in our country, in our culture. Uh, the sort of like modern period par excellence in which we live in the wake of. And here you have this art that's just like adamantly abstract, dumb as a post. Um, and yet, I still think that there's something kind of resilient here, that these boxy forms, uh, you know, we still live in a grid. We still carry, and I'm looking at my cell phone right now, um, these squares that seem to sort of, con these dark squares that seem to contain all of our subjectivity, that that sort of interest in the black. Judd once wrote, the black hole does not allude to a black hole. It is one <laughs> in, this, uh, in reference to this particular piece. This interest in sort of looking into the depth of these abstract, opaque, but reflectively radiant spaces, I think is our, our aesthetic legacy today. Um, and then on a more kind of personal side note, I, um, you know, it was an, so the summer that I, I hung these prints at the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers was immediately preceded by uh, the opportunity to hang three works by three prominent African-American artists in, um, in the upstairs galleries. Uh, this is Kerry James Marshall's uh, one of part of his Lost Boys series from 1993. Uh, this is David Driscoll, Woman with Flowers, a collage piece uh, from the mid 70s. And this is Barclay Hendricks, Brenda P. Um, and just looking at the way in which the language of reusing found objects, of collage, of paying attention to the surface informed Driscoll. Driscoll, who sort of, I would guess in my research, he took the face uh, from a beauty ad from Ebony Magazine. He incorporates sort of African woodcuts, his own photography, visiting, visiting deserts in Africa with popular culture. There's a cruciform uh, shape behind her. Um, and this sort of creates a new altar. Um, Barclay Hendricks, you know, has this sort of, I mean, how 70s is this, this image? But at the same time, there's this sort of like reference to uh, the, kind of like Afrocentric black liberation movement, the red, black, and green of her outfit, both fashionable and political. And then the sort of somber, uh, flat minimalism to some extent with elements of abstract expressionism and figurative painting. Of course, all three of these artists are almost insistently figurative of Carrie James Marshall's Lost Boys. Um, you know, I don't think that these, my conclusion, and this is what I want to talk with all of you about is, that these artists didn't leave, you know, Martin and Judd don't leave sort of like, they, they didn't say all there was to say about, about this. Um, you know, what I was read a, um, a piece on, on inclusivity in Judd's work and the, and the writer um, <clears throat> quoted Judd saying, when earlier Judd warned of an entirely formalistic, meaning just paying attention to the colors and the form, discussion of work, he went on to say that, quote, almost any kind of statement can be derived from the work, philosophical, psychological, sociological, political. Such statements, usually nonsense, should refer to specific elements in the work. So that may seem like a kind of um, stubbornly anti-political 
um, thing to say, particularly in the 1960s about one's work being created in the midst of all these protests. Um, but the writer reflected and said, one such element, the work's polarization, carries a strong sociological ramification. Numerous incidences remind us daily just how easy it is to activate and destructively accentuate differences between us, whether on the social front through the persecution of minorities or on the domestic front where divorce proceedings due to irreconcilable differences clutter family law courts. While polarization enables a differentiation between parts, Power alone is not found within its dichotomy. The human dimension of polarization is witness to the sheer power needed to overcome its segregation as unity, as inclusion. It is this unity that Judd Space champions in us. Um, and so, you know, in the midst of this kind of like having to, to some extent, uh, uh, you know, incorporate, I think what's on a lot of our minds, um, I'm trying to find where, where y'all are. Uh, y'all aren't looking at my personal photos, are you? Um, in the midst of trying to incorporate what's on a lot of our minds, I think this might be the, a good opportunity for us to uh, open up my talk to all of you and, and your questions. Um, so I'm, Am I back on the screen now? It's, your screen is still shared, Ted. It's it's a uh, okay. Up at the top, you should see like end screen share. Oh, there we go. Cool. Okay. Nice. Now you're back. Yeah, I'm back. So, awesome. how, how should we do the Q and A? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you for that. And and if anybody has questions, um, you can just raise your hand like I explained earlier with the um, if you click participants you should see a raise hand button oh Suzanne did you have a question or oh Sonia has a question here we go Sonia yes hi can you hear me yeah. hi um yeah so I wanted to ask like I guess you don't really or maybe I missed it, but what were the artists, um, like, did their art change at all when they moved out of the city? Like you said, yeah. they both moved out from New York to like, yeah. Yeah, great question. Sorry, I guess I probably should have addressed that if that was the point of the talk. Um, <laughs> you know, what, I think what it is is that for both, I, I wanted to position Night Sea as a work where the, both the grid, which had been introduced in Martin's work uh, from the early 60s, kind of reaches this moment of kind of like poetic complexity. Um, mm -hmm. And this allows for her, once she returns to art back in New Mexico in the early 1970s, she starts building her paintings out of this grid framework. So for me, I, I, I mean, this is probably like sort of wishy-washy, but I would think that like, the grid is sort of a vestige of this sort of er, this urban experience from living in this sort of extremely rectilinear space of of like the loft of lower Manhattan of of the spaces in which she sort of experienced and was inspired by, and yet she sort of stretches this out and eventually through in her later work, it almost disappears completely you know like at a certain point she renounces the grid and starts working in stripes and starts working in horizontals and and her work becomes like as you move away from it. And even in pieces like that, it, those, those little lines seem to dissolve. So I think um, in the case of Martin, the, that pivotal few years between about 1961 and 1967, where she develops her sort of mature work, she also ruthlessly destroyed any work that she didn't deem up to snuff. Like, you know, numerous critics would come and visit her in, in Taos and like, you know, she'd be like, which one? you know, what's your favorite one? And they'd point out like, you know, two or three out of five paintings on the wall and she would literally cut them up on the spot, the ones that, that like she agreed weren't, weren't good enough. Um, as far as Judd goes, yes, I think that the experiments with, or his like playfulness with these materials that began with sort of a lead pipe with sort of taking sculpture sculptural objects off of the plinth, hanging them on the wall um, with his connections with, you know, all of his work was actually produced in a, by the Bernstein brothers, a factory in Long Island City. Um, he didn't make art in Marfa. 
but Marfa allowed for him to have the space. You know, there's an interview with him where he says, you know, I like the Southwest because it's close to Mexico. There's a lot of space and there's not a lot of people. I have time to think. Work never gets made here, but I have time to think. So it's like, I think for him leaving this, the city was where you worked. The city was where you made connections. The city was where business happens, but the desert for, for both of these, for, for him was where you were inspired, where you thought, where ideas were generated. And for Martin, it was where she could, could actually, after sort of giving up painting is where she could return to it. So then in some ways they per performed an almost inverse function. I should also mention that Donald Judd did, you know, after he stopped making paintings, he did not make his work at all. He had his, his work fabricated. Those prints were, were printed, were produced by his father who was, a, who was trained as a printmaker. Um, you know, his hand, he said, you know, I don't learn anything from, from making them, so there's no point to it. And the people that I hire to do it could probably do it better than me. Whereas for Martin, um, I think that inch by inch, square by square, rectangle by rectangle, rectangle um, immersion was, was key to her, her art making. So would you say that with Martin, she, you said he, she started painting like more like stripes. I'm imagining like her looking at the horizon of like the barren landscape of the non city yeah. that she moved into. And that's what like inspired her later paintings. I, I would not, I would say that she wouldn't say that, but I would like to think that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? These artists aren't around. So it's our, you know, whatever. They however we want. Wanna, yeah. <laughs> so um, where, so were, were Judd's, uh, was Judd's work fabricated? Like where was it fabricated? It was fabricated in a factory in Long Island City, and then it would be even delivered. when you moved to Marfa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. wow, that's expensive. <laughs> yeah, and the, then it would be like delivered to uh, to these spaces, you know, at these spaces that he's like essentially having built anyway, you know. So, so like, yeah. there's a there's a film that was made in the early 1970s, just as he's moving out there with his family, and it's just like these raw, decrepit broken down desert spaces and then these like gleaming aluminum boxes uh being pulled <laughs> out of cardboard um yeah i mean it's you know they, these remember that he had like you know a four-year-old and a seven-year-old in this loft like there was there was yogurt there was di there were dirty diapers like these weren't these sort of austere spaces of aesthetic delectation these were living and working spaces and the 70s seemed pretty messy <laughs> Thank you for your question. I hope I didn't weasel. Oh, no, no, thank you. That <laughs> never really clarified it. Sure. Yeah, thank you for pushing me to answer the topic of my talk. Uh, do we have any more? Uh, all right, I see you. Kylie. Yeah, Kylie. Where do it? Uh, you should be unmuted now. Can we hear you now? We can't hear you yet. Um. Oh wait, oh, we, I, we hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I like the more I zoom, the worse I get at it. <laughs> um, uh, so I was curious about um, uh, basically. I, I think that they're both both of these artists are absolutely incredible. But I was curious about if you have any favorites or artists that you think that people should look at that are not independently wealthy. <laughs> Uh, you mean, I think most of the artists I know currently are not independently wealthy, but are you talking about sort of artists that didn't have this sort of institutional support to do these things? Um, uh, are you talking about contemporary no. or, or, uh, or historically? Um, historically, I guess. I mean, I, I would, I would, I mean, originally I was asking in, in relation to this dialogue of the sense of like, uh, flatness and space and the unity and inclusion of like a basic object, but also like with Agnes's sensitivity. So I, mm -hmm. I mean, at first thought in relationship to them, but 
I mean, I'm, I'm interested in really anybody because I feel like there's a division between um, people making work that is like, you don't feel like it's that related to the 60s. Yeah. It, it, for me, it doesn't. I think that's an important part of their work is that it's strictly Not about what it's about. But that yeah. made me wonder if there's any artists that you love that are 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 um that were making art in a context in which they didn't have the support from like the Guggenheim or from Pace Gallery or or Leo Castelli or things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, or old money. or old family money. Like it's awesome to see people that can buy buildings, but that's yeah. also hard to. Well, what's really interesting is, <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> if you want like a, a bitter read, read this. Uh, this is like every, it's biblical looking and it's about the size and shape of a brick. And you can sort of see the young kind of like cocksure idealist in Judd uh, transform into an embittered outsider who feels completely disconnected from the art world by the 1980s and 1990s. Um, in other words, he was completely, you know, like in this interview in 1972, he's just like, we moved to Soho to get away from people and now it's becoming, you know, another 10th Street. And it's like 10th Street in the way that like no good art is coming out of this place and there are no good ideas. And like, you know, I know three people and none of them are selling anymore. You know, and, and, and so much of like the, the limitations of his work, it becomes increasingly clear, uh, are, are financial. You know, in other words, like moving from a found object, a, a, an iron pipe and plywood, which probably costs like $35 to make, uh, to like those plywood boxes that filled the entire space of Leo Castelli, which were made in 1980. By the 1990s, I mean, the Chinati Foundation or the, you know, the, what his uh, his complex in Marfa was in massive debt. And so um, I think if anything, both of these artists in many ways suffered from, it may seem now like what they did was completely financially inconceivable today. Um, and that's probably true, but both the it, people would vandalize Agnes Martin's work. They would like fill in the squares Throw, I, throw ice cream at it because they felt it was too abstract. These grids were to be colored in. Like um, the sort of enshrinement of these artists is these great towering geniuses with this like megalomaniacal power over space, um, I think is a recent invention. I think it's a recent mythology. And I think by the 1980s, when you had new capital flooding into downtown New York, you had the galleries arriving, you had blue chip investors, you had finance people like investing in art. It was sort of neo-expressionists who were making all the money and artists like Judd and I mean I think Martin was kind of just trucking along in her own way with with collectors and galleries that wanted to show her by that point but um if he wasn't actually broke he certainly thought he was broke so I guess to answer your question because I'm really you know art history in many ways is a is a history written by the winners by the insiders who are who are next to the artists who by the collectors who have paid the critic to say something fawn fawning over the work and um, it's much more difficult for me to find examples of uh, artists who were not financially successful because, frankly, their art, you know, and as an historian, they, their art doesn't show up in museum. Uh, they don't have retrospectives. They don't have gallery shows. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm sitting in my dad's painting studio, <laughs> so I, I guess I'll cite him. But uh, yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. It's uh, it's a dis the answer takes me down a dark and discouraging path. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. I, I don't want to. I don't want to tell, you know, I don't want to give that tell that story to to an artist I admire. Um, <clears throat> any other questions? Can I? Or wait, Kylie, you can keep a uh, you know. Do y'all know how to uh, do the ra hand raising function? Because I'm just figuring that out too. And so it's on the participants and then you do, you 
All right. Well, I'm getting, I would happily answer another few questions, but I'm getting dangerously close to my 90 minute mark here. Um, so unless, yeah. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Cool. I think I explained all of it. Yeah, you did a great job. Um, well, I want to thank you. This was actually my first Zoom lecture I've ever given, and I was insanely nervous and knocking over glasses of water and oh. cleaning my desktop, making sure there weren't any like just, you know incriminating screenshots or anything. Oh, you have I think yeah. Suzanne has a question. Yeah. I'm seeing. Uh... Are you on mute? Am I? Oh, she's on mute. Yeah, hold on. Ted, I, this isn't so much a question as a, oh. uh, just a thought uh, that I'd had about observing um, uh, kind of a strength of figurative art in African-American artists. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You showed uh, Carrie James Marshall, but also thinking of Kara Walker and Amy Sherald and even... Mm -hmm. Andy Wiley. I mean, so much, which I wonder how that relates in terms of the uh, minimalism or abstraction, um, more conceptual, and, and yeah. uh, just a resurgence to the human and the body and the um, as a as a political or as a statement of humanity or I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, no. I thank you. That's a very good question, and I think first it would be important to kind of historicize African American artists in the 20th century. There were certainly uh, numerous prominent uh, black abstractionists in the spiral group in Harlem in the 1950s and 1960s. But um, when you, you mentioned Carrie James Marshall, uh, Ken Day Wiley, Carol Walker. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that without oversimplifying their work, and I'm definitely not an expert in kind of 21st century contemporary figurative painting, but I think uh, so an undercurrent that kind of connects a lot of these uh, these artists is representation, is, is like reinserting uh, black faces and black bodies into canon, the canon of like Western beauty. And so in many ways, you can sort of interpret that uh, the sort of the right to be abstract and the, the right to, or like the, I mean, there's a, there's an incredible amount of privilege with, with like insisting that a, you know, a black hole is, you know, red and black are just in, red and black and don't signify anything. And there's an incredible amount of privilege in, in like suggesting that, you know, we don't, you're, you're not allowed to see anything but night sea in Agnes Martin's painting. Um, but I think a lot of, you know, Carrie James Marshall was was inspired by Charles White, who was you know sort of like around the same age as Agnes Martin. Uh, you have these artists. There's a an alternate, you know, a strong figurative history in 20, 20th and twentieth century art. Um, it's not a story of abstraction, and and often this is about one's own, the artist's own relationship to to the history of Western art, to the history of figurative art, and of course. African art if, uh, can, is also both like expressively figurative, uh, highly realistic, uh, representational, and can be abstract. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in Amer American art history, I would say that there's, uh, these artists have been kind of charged with a different duty or have, have attempted to sort of reinsert the black body into these Western can canons of beauty. Um, but these are also all artists that do I think I mean I you know Kara Walker in particular um, her installations although they are sculpture make no mistake about it they they also kind of play with that history of sculpture in the same way that Donald Judd does that they're about like your relationship to the space that you know these these figures made out of molasses that slowly decompose in the domino sugar factory on the Brooklyn waterfront um, that has right. to do with process in our own spatial relationship so I think um, you know, that's a, that's a topic for a different talk, but I, I definitely I, understands the way in which like, you know, is it's good to press me on, on the fact that I, I brought up three figurative artists that happened to be in the, in the gallery at the same time as, as the Jed Prince. And, and it's important to, to talk about what figurative art, what place figure, 
figurative art holds in, in the 20th and 21st century. And I honestly, I never thought it was dead. I mean, I don't, you know, like people, the leading artists today are figurative artists. Um, and it's, and we like to, I, I don't think that it's, um, it's a lot oh, strangely right. more, e you know, I think the the goals of Agnes Martin and Donald Judd in many ways are, were sort of thwarted by the the return of figurative art that, you know, finance people start investing in art in the eighties and they want to see, you know, portraits painted on plates and like, you know, like the, the figure return, cause that's easy to understand and it relates directly to the history of art. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, I write about figurative art, so I'm a fan. Yeah, no, I know. But thank you Thanks. for your question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I just also wanted to um, thank you for that comment. Um, yes, most of these abstract expressionists were super inspired by Mexican muralists. Um, also, you know, I would, I would say that George O'Keefe is a very important precursor to the New York urbane artists moving out west. And that Pollock, in fact, also was looking at, um, you know, in Native American artists of the southwest and their, and their you know, sort of like sand paintings as as a key influence to to his work so yeah this isn't a you know when i talk about sort of the, the relationship to to western culture and to the museum and the, the western canon um these artists are drawing their influence from all over the place and and that's a very narrow lens of like the metropolitan museum of art or something or the western canon to to determine these what these artists are doing um Any any other questions? Should we wrap it up? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank cool, you. Cool. Thank you all. I yeah, thank you so much, Ted. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, we'll definitely have have Ted back soon. Um, we're actually planning something. Time Time Out New York, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, has now become Time Time in New York since nobody can go out anymore. Um, and we're planning a little uh, Instagram session with Time Out New York and Ted, which would be really cool on. On the tenderloin and and the flat iron districts or what yeah if that's the one they want i'm happy yeah. to talk about it it's as you can see is i always root my art history and urban history so yeah um yeah. yeah i love how you always bring in the architectural element to the, to the art history courses but um everyone look forward to that one and thank you all so much for being here thanks ted thank all you right. have a good night good night